everybody and welcome to Think Gin 2021. Uh, today I'm delighted to spend 15 minutes with Warner's Gin founder Tom Warner to talk about how the team have managed to get that balance right between craft and scale. So hello Tom. That's hello. Great that you can be here today. Um, so we, we know that craft premium and locally produced gins are popular, have been for a while, uh, consumers are out there seeking out those authentic messages. Um, but many of these are small batch producers with gins that may not have listings on a national scale. Um, Warner's though has managed to grow considerably since it started and many would agree that it's a good example of a brand that has managed to maintain that craft image while also expanding beyond that small scale production. So, so my first question really is, um, when you started out um, looking at your forecasting models in the early days, did you, did you always have a plan or a, a real aim to grow bigger than, than what we might consider to be small batch producer? Um, it, I, I think, yeah, you, you, it, it's all about context, isn't it, for your business? And you, need, you really need to set that context out from the start because that will then drive every single decision we always knew we were never going to be Diageo because you know that's just never going to happen. Yeah. But we we definitely had sort of um, unbounded ambition in terms of the growth that we were going to bring into the business. Um, but I mean, the lens I would put over the top of that is that we had absolutely no experience in the beers, wines, and spirits industry, and we'd never run our own company before. So, and we'd never, we'd never, we you know, when we were doing our business plan, we didn't even own a still at that point. So mm. there was a huge amount that we had to learn. Um, but what we had was, you know, the, the passion and the drive to, to make it happen and to learn. Um, and um, also, you know, the, our context has always been to make the best possible liquid. Uh, and to do that, you need to use the best, um, sorry, the best process, the best equipment and the best ingredients to do so. So that's, you know, that's the cornerstone of what we're doing. Mm. And if that led to us gaining more orders, then that was a great thing. And the opportunity we saw within gin specifically, but I think spirits globally, if you roll back to 2009-10 when we were doing our original business plans, it was a completely different landscape. It was dominated by multinational businesses that owned all the relationships, they had the distribution models, they, and they still do. I mean, within craft, we're all fooling ourselves that we're causing them any sort of pain. You know, they've all massively benefited from craft because craft has legitimized all of the, um, all of the sort of the large produced products all around the world. Um, but it was wide open for independent businesses to come on and steal a small amount of the rug by giving buyers that were out there a, a stick to beat their incumbent suppliers with. I mean, we are in danger because if you look at a, a, at a macro level in retail UK, the big brands are turning the screw back on now. You know, they, they've, they've worked out what craft is. They've made some acquisitions. They've replicated flavour profiles. And they're, they're, you know, they already had enough volume, but they're hoovering back all of the sort of inroads that craft was making into them. Um, so it's been quite interesting. But, but, but I think um, we had no idea, interestingly, first four years of the business we actually grew at the pace we thought we would grow within the business plan which was probably some would say ambitious I think to replicate that now when the way the market's gone would be really bloody difficult but you know success turns luck into genius that's what I like to say we were very lucky because we started when we started so launching in 2012 mm. we were some would argue we were slightly behind the curve with the resources that we had um but actually, you know, we, we benefited from the surge within gin. And because we were right at the start, we almost were able to write the narrative uh, mm. for that and, and actually create a lot of the excitement or the blueprint for what craft produ production is within the UK. Um, so, um, yeah, we, you know, we had a plan. Did we know how we were going to actually achieve that? No, is the reality. You know, I'll be very honest with that. You know, it was all bound by ambition. And yes, we're going to do this. If, if we'd had an adult in the room at the time that was industry experienced, they probably would have tempered that. And we may not have achieved what we ended up achieving because, you know, there's almost, a, a, I like to say, an infantile or blissful, you know, naivety is bliss, isn't it? When you don't truly understand the market, then well, anything's possible. And I think that's great for any entrepreneur to have that lens of, 
you know, when we started, there was no fear. It was going to happen. We were going to make this happen. It was going to be great. And our products were going to be fantastic. And really, that's what got Warners to, 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 to where we are today. Um, but we were never bound by we're only we're going to cap our production at a certain level. And I think there are a lot of misconceptions. And sometimes I think as a nation, we can we can do each other down quite successfully as Brits sometimes. And I think when does a brand segue from being craft to not being craft? And, you know, we're actually more masochistic now in terms of how we make our liquors than we've ever been. We seem to constantly make even more complicated products that require even more ingredients to be grown from the farm, but we're selling more than we've ever sold. So it's it's at what point and what justification? Because there are lots of what I would describe as non-craft brands that sell probably 10% of the volume that we sell every year, whereas we are painfully craft in everything that we do. And mm. craft is another word that we're never going to actually get to the bottom of, are we? I think we should... You know, Alex from East London Liquor Company, he always tears it down as, you know, they're not craft. And I think it's true, you know, what, what is craft? Unfortunately, it's become an overused and abused marketing term, small batch. Uh, but if that's the context of your business, then that's great. You know, if you're only ever going to sell to people locally to you and, and you're happy with that, then that's, that's fine as well. So it's all to like, back to what I said at the start, the context of the business. Ours has always been make the best liquid you possibly can, but that's irrespective of how much we sell. Excellent. I mean, I, I was going to ask you um, next what kind of challenges you face. It, it sounds a bit like you, you've set your own challenges as you've, as you've gone along and um, increasingly put more and more um, challenges in place. Um, I suppose one of the, the, the points I wanted to ask really was when you started to really grow out of what... Of, of any small scale and you were it was growing in popularity and you obviously had to ramp up production at, at that point some some producers would perhaps look at how they could cut costs to balance that out or changing suppliers which is um uh, different for you if you're starting from being your own suppliers i suppose and um, did you did you have to make any difficult decisions during those stages I think there's loads of difficult decisions as you move forward as, as, as a business um but you know we've we've we're, we're proud of the fact we've never really cut corners i suppose one of one of the things we have changed uh, and it's really a mindset change of understanding uh, for me we do slightly bigger batches in the dis when we're distilling now than we used to and i really do mean slightly bigger they're probably three times the size because we we only ever did one shot and when you when you start uh, a craft gin distillery, it's sort of a mantra that you live and die by that ours are one shot. But do you know what? It's been an education for me because one shot's actually the easiest form of making uh, gin. And going into a concentrated multi-shot is really, really bloody difficult when you're scaling up. And we've got quite a small kit. We didn't have, you know, we didn't have the space to put in additional equipment. We're now up to four stills at the farm. Um, but two of those are actually quite small and they're more for trial or limited editions. We've got two, two 500 litre stills and um, using them efficiently and scaling that up has, has actually meant that you need to put more skill into that. So that's probably one, I would say, compromise, but actually it, it drives consistency into your operation. Uh, it's probably better for consistency of products moving forward. It's better for the environment. Because you know you pro rata your your um, gas usage per per bottle produced from a distillation, uh, and you know you can easily do a carbon calculation of what you're doing there. So that's one thing that we've done, but we're doing it very willingly because we believe it to be the right thing to do for for, for product quality and for the environment. Um, but we're still doing relatively small batches with that as well compared to you know the guys that are producing these global brands. Um, but other than that, we've we've probably become more uh, sort of as i've said it already masochistic when we're making our products you know there's there's our london dry this summer there's a recipe tweak because that's now finally going to become farm born we've got ahead of the curve um we've expanded our growing on the farm by 200 percent uh, this year so huge amount more plants went in the ground last year just to try and get so we can finally make the claim of self-sufficient in our london dry gin with uh, three of the botanicals that go into that and it's you know, that's a really difficult process. When you're working with Mother Nature, you know, you're at the whims of the weather. And at the moment, the launch of that liquid 
probably going to be delayed slightly because of the frost we've had in the last seven days. Um, but um, for us, we believe we get a better liquid from growing the ingredients and harvesting them when we want them. Mm. Um, so it makes your life a lot harder, but it, um, it is the best thing for the liquid. And again, it's all about the context for your brand. Many of the, many of the craft brands, in fact, exclusively probably nearly all of them that have sold by now of the early starters, you know, if you break it down, those guys started those businesses to build and sell. You know, that was, that was always the dream and the ambition, and that's not our dream or ambition. So we're not looking to cut corners and maximise profit. We're looking to always make the best possible liquid for the consumers. And it's, again, so it's, it's all about setting the context of your business. And, you know, if, if, if your goal is to launch a spirits business, to launch a gin uh, brand today, and then sell it to Diageo in, well, I don't know, five years time, then you're going to make certain decisions on that journey to maximise your volumes as quickly as possible and probably maximise your, your profitability within that to drive a, a multiple. That seems to be sort of an industry standard thought process if you have to do this. I think craft's a bit more beautiful than that. You know, the small producers, it's my name's on the bottle. You know, it's, it's the pride and passion that, that goes into every single... Um, product that we produce and, and it's that care and effort so yeah we've we've not really cut corners uh if anything we, we make our lives as you know uh, <laughs> way harder than they need to be and specifically within flavored gin which has exploded and is now roughly 40 percent of the gin category love it or loathe it um it kind of originated from our farm in terms of the elderflower and the rhubarb that we launched to the market unfortunately it's like pandora's box being opened and there's the spawn of satan that's plaguing sort of a, a lot of retail spaces at the moment but general public uk is buying it in very large numbers you know all of these synthetically flavored or flavored uh alcohols that probably not even been through a still it's just ethanol water and flavorings and sugar um which is quite saddening to see especially for all the small producers that are out there yeah, the way we make a flavoured gin, it's a London dry gin that has real fruit juice added to it. That's, in essence, how it's done at the farm. And some of those crops are grown here at the farm, but you're working with nature. You're at the behest of nature. And um, if sugar's added, it's because you need to balance acidity rather than just making an alka pop. Um, so um, I think it, it, it could be easy when the category is being dominated now by products that are cutting corners. It's probably could be quite tempting for the craft guys to go down that road. But I think, you know, then it all becomes meaningless. And, and what is craft and what are small producers? Small producers are there to shine a light on the big guys. And it's our efforts that although we do not have the power, we're never going to beat them, we're never going to win. It's still holding the, the sort of the heat to their feet uh, to try and push the quality aspect of the category always upwards. Um, so, yeah, it's... In answer to your question, no, we, we seem to make our lives harder uh, <laughs> along the journey, um, which is counterintuitive. But again, I think it's corporate versus, you know, small, small businesses owned by uh, real people. And you have different uh, different contexts for why you're doing things. Mm, excellent. And I mean, it sort of leads to my to my final question where I, I just wanted to ask specifically about your um, focus on sustainability that you've got there. And um um, have had from the early days um, so we have a discussion later on today about um, sustainable and ethical brands um, which which is perhaps more talked about by gin producers than some of the other spirit categories um, uh, and and we're, we will be talking about um, whether consumers are recognizing those authentic messages out from those that are perhaps not so authentic um, your focus was was really there from before you even started really from from the way that you started do you think it's it's one of the keys to your success in in sort of keeping that image i think it will be in the future yeah. i think key to success at this stage no i don't think it was uh, and, and i genuinely you know we're, we're putting a huge amount of effort into it and there are some amazing examples within the gin category because of the entrepreneurialism that's out there you've got some guys that are way ahead of us in terms of their journey but when you're starting from a blank piece of paper you can do that really quickly and really efficiently so i think the advantage because of the entrepreneurialism within the category the younger the business the easier to increase that percentage of your focus to, to sustainability 
Um, we really, really, really got stuck into it, I suppose, 2016 is when we really started to really hammer it into the business. Um, last year, we became 1% for the Planet members, so 1% of our revenues, not profit, so it's above the line. That goes to uh, environmental issues around the world, uh, but ours are really focused into to the UK. And um, we've just yesterday actually um, uh, submitted our B Corp application. So we're on the journey to becoming a B Corp a certified business as well. And within that, there's a huge amount, and this is all a journey. And what we need to remember is, because some people I think could try and use green uh, and environmentalism as, as point scoring for commercial gain. And the reality is it, it should just be business. It's about looking at the triple bottom line. It's about investing for the future and, you know, most business is focused on how much money you make. And I think that's why we're in the position we're in with the planet. Um, and we all need to be thinking about, you know, um, environmental issues, what it's actually cost in terms of people, in terms of planet, uh, et cetera, when we're looking at a bottom line. So you may have made a profit, but Mother Earth may be in a, in a massive, massive, massive loss as a result. So there's a whole evolution to go through. Um, but it's really exciting that, that gin is this beacon at the moment. I think it's also starting to happen quite rapidly in rum. The rum category is following suit. I think that's because of the, the energy that's, that's within gin. Has it driven our sales up until now? No, I don't think it has. Um, and, you know, two of the products that, that we've got direct payments, which is part of our 1%, aren't our most successful ones in terms of money contributions going. So I don't think it's a driver with the consumer at the moment. It should be a driver for every business person on the planet because very quickly, you know, with climate crisis that's emerging, profitability is going to be really, really difficult because if our, if our habitats that we're all living in, if people are migrating from all the different parts of the world, I feel like I'm getting quite preachy now, but, um, you know, this is something that it should just be day to day within business and um, everybody's on a journey, hopefully, within this. Uh, and it, it's not about being, because there's some big brands that have come out and said they want to be the, you know, the number one X, the, the most ethically sourced gin, I won't name names, but... It's not about being number one. It's about everybody being as good as they can be to sort of to, to behave in a responsible way. So um, we try and distance ourselves from financial points growing within that. You just try and do your best. Um, and, and as you know, we've had, we've had a couple of great wins recently this year in the Footprint Sustainability Awards. We got a couple of um, awards there. I think we were the most nominated business within that. Um, and it's, it's just a really exciting soul enriching space to be in for anyone that's in business if you can if you can have a business reduce your footprint on the planet employ people make some money at the end of the day uh, and strive to be better i think that's what we all just need to be doing it shouldn't be isolated to gin but all of the craft guys have the unique position to being very young businesses which means they can put it at the center of what they're doing uh, and just just be a business that's a force for good Fantastic. Thank you, Tom. Thanks for um, all of your comments. Pleasure. I think we've, we've reached the end of our 15 minute slot. And it's, it sounds like the team has, has always been passionate from the start about everything you grow and create and build there. And uh, it'd be great to hear more about that over the future of, of, of what you're up to next. Thanks for coming on today. <laughs> Absolute pleasure. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Tom. <laughs>